Um, we use the word Islam commonly in two related but distinct senses. We use it as the equivalent of Christianity. That's to say a religion in the strict sense of that word. A system of belief and worship and scripture with some kind of professional organization that discharges its functions. We also use Islam in a much broader sense as the equivalent of Christendom. That's to say a whole civilization which grew up under the aegis of that religion but which contains many elements that are not part of that religion, elements even that are in a very basic sense contrary to that religion. As an example of what I mean, uh, let me take the Nazis, to whom we've had a number of references during the last hour. <clears throat> No one could seriously argue that Hitler and the Nazis came out of Christianity. But no one could seriously dispute that they came out of Christendom. I think that should suffice to make my point clear. <clears throat> it is common practice, <clears throat> both in the Muslim world and in the rest of the world, to use the word Islam in these two senses, these two related but different senses. And therefore, I think it's important to bear this in mind, considering whether this or that or the other thing is essentially part of Islam, is characteristic of Islam, whether Islam as such can be blamed for it, and so on. <coughs> Sorry. Many of the things which we have seen in this film are part of Islam in even the narrow sense. Others are part of Islam, if at all, only in the very broad sense. <coughs> the public discussion about Islam in modern times has been very wide and very varied, and we're, generally speaking, being given two different versions. According to one, we have told, and we hear this phrase repeatedly, Islam is a religion of peace. Rather like the Quakers, but without their aggressiveness. <laughs> On the other hand, we have the image of Islam as a religion of bloodthirsty fanatics symbolized by the warrior riding out of the desert on horseback with the Quran in one hand and the sword in the other, offering his victims the choice between the two. It's a familiar image. Well, Islam is a religion of peace, but not in the sense in which that is stated. Muslims are nowhere commanded to love their enemies or to turn the other cheek. Their attitude to such matters as I would say, closer to smiting the Amalekites, which would be familiar to us. The <clears throat> Sorry, I seem to have a dry throat today. <clears throat> On the other hand, well, let me deal, deal with the, the alternative first. The, the other image, that of the fanatical warrior riding out of the desert with the sword in one hand and the Koran in the other, is not only untrue, it's impossible, unless we are to assume a race of left-handed swordsmen. <laughs> the left hand, by tradition, is reserved for unclean purposes. No self-respecting Muslim would ever raise the Koran in his left hand. No, the truth is in its usual place, somewhere between the two extremes. Um, Islam does lay down a certain level of tolerance. According to our modern notions, tolerance is in itself an intolerant idea. But for a long time, it was the best that was available. And for many centuries, the movement of refugees was from Christendom to Islam, not from the Islamic world to Christendom. But things have changed. There is also <clears throat> the question of the attitude to war and peace. 
Islam is not as is formal Christianity opposed to war. War is accepted as a necessary part of reality and there is indeed a notion of what is usually translated holy war, the conventional translation of jihad. But because it is part of the religion, it is also part of the holy war. And being part of the holy law, it is elaborately regulated. Um, Islamic law, like Jewish law, like rabbinic law, I mean, was developed over a long period by a, a whole series of reasoning processes using both scripture and tradition and argumentation as well. And uh, the Islamic law is a very complex structure which devotes a considerable section to the conduct of war. And there are the laws of war, what you may do, what you may not do. And these are vastly different from the kind of approach to war and struggle which we have just seen in this film. Um, it is necessary, according to the Sharia, holy law, uh, to give a proper declaration of war, to give due warning, um, to conduct warfare according to certain rules, um, which many things are forbidden, and not to attack non-combatants, and so on and so on and so forth. Uh, the question of suicide, for example, in the Muslim view, suicide is what we would nowadays call, or what the Western world would call, uh, a mortal sin. This is expressly forbidden by the holy law. And not only that, but we are told what is the punishment of suicide. If anyone commits suicide, even if he has lived a life of unremitting virtue, he forfeits paradise and goes straight to hell. And his eternal punishment in hell is the endless repetition of the act of suicide. An imaginative punishment, I think you all agree. So that one who hangs himself can look forward to an eternity of strangulation. One who poisons himself to an eternity of bellyache. And presumably the suicide bombers to an eternity of exploding fragments. So you may ask, well, how then do we get to this? Well, a lot of strange things have been happening quite recently. <clears throat> and let me turn now, since time is short, to some of the more recent developments in the Islamic world and particularly in the self-perception of Muslims. But first a word or two of introduction on that. There are many religions in the world, all of which believe that their truths are universal. But most of them fall into the category of what is sometimes known as a relativist religion. They believe that just as Humanity has invented many different languages to talk to each other. Humanity has invented many different religions to talk to God. And God understands them all equally well. Well, perhaps not equally well, but understands them all. Um, this is a view which is clearly stated in the Talmud, for example, where it is said that the righteous of all peoples have a place in paradise. The other view, sometimes known by its critics as the triumphalist view, a view which is summed up in the classical formula, I'm right, you're wrong, go to hell. <laughs> the triumphalist perception of religion would run something like this. We are the fortunate recipients of God's final message to humanity, which it is our duty not to keep selfishly for ourselves like the Jews, but to bring to all humanity, removing whatever obstacles there may be on the way. Triumphalist religions basically have been two, Christianity and Islam. And given that these two religions shared this self-perception, and in addition to that shared a great deal of the culture, the past, the history, the experience, and the the neighborhood in which they lived side by side. Given that, conflict between the two, the competition for the privilege of enlightening all humanity, was waged for many, many centuries. The unending series of jihad and counter-jihad and crusade and counter-crusade and the like. Now, in the Christian world, this triumphalist approach has almost disappeared. 
not quite, but it has almost disappeared. And it is certainly not in any part of, the, any part of Christendom the dominant view. Not even in the Vatican, for example, where we have seen not long ago the spectacle of a pope apologizing to the Muslims for the Crusades. Rather remarkable if one considers that the Crusade was really a, a late, limited, and incompetent imitation of the Jihad. The triumphalist approach in Islam did continue. And it, it's hardly surprising if we remember that Christianity is now in its 21st century and Islam is in its 15th. It takes a little while to get over these things. <laughs> Triumphalist Islam received an enormous <clears throat> encouragement, an enormous stimulation in one of the mo most important events of recent history, namely the defeat and collapse of the Soviet Union. We are accustomed to think of that as a Western, and some would say more specifically, an American victory in the Cold War. Many Muslims see it differently, as a Muslim victory in the Jihad. And remember how it happened. The, Soviet, the Red Army was defeated by the Taliban in Afghanistan, driven from Afghanistan in defeat, defeat and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So that when the Muslims claim the defeat and collapse of the Soviet Union as their victory, this is, to say the very least, not implausible. The subsequent thought development of, of ideas and attitudes, we can follow fairly closely, thanks to a man you may have heard of, called Osama bin Laden, who expresses himself, his views and his opinions, his perceptions, I should say, with great elegance, eloquence, and clarity. As he saw it, there has been a cosmic struggle going on between the two rival religions, the two rival world religions, Islam and Christianity, since the advent of Islam in the seventh century of the Christian era. Um, we can even document it. If you look at the inscriptions in the Dome of the Rock, not very far from here, you will see it stated. Well, first of all, the position, a site sacred in the Judeo-Christian tradition. The architecture um, related to the early Christian churches and the text engraved inside the dome. He is God, he is one, he has no companion, he does not beget, he is not begotten. In other words, an explicit challenge to Christianity. The, the caliph was saying to the emperor, your time has passed, your religion is superseded, move over, we are taking over the world. And that has remained the attitude from then onwards. Coming back to Osama bin Laden, he describes how the caliphate, which headed the Muslim world, was held by a number of different dynasties in a number of different places, and Damascus, Baghdad, Cairo, finally Istanbul, and then came the moment of utter final shame when the caliphate was abolished by the Turkish Republic and the last Muslim states defeated and subjugated. Similarly, as he sees it, the Christian world was ruled by a succession of different empires and dynasties, which it was the Muslim duty to fight, until the final stage in which it was disputed between two rival superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And as he puts it, we have now successfully defeated and destroyed the more dangerous, the more deadly of the two. Dealing with the pampered and effeminate Americans will be easy. It now remains to complete the job and achieve the final triumph of Islam. That view was encouraged by the events of the 90s when we saw a series of attacks on American installations in various places in the world, the embassies in East Africa, um, a worship in the Yemen, various barracks in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, bringing either minimal or any totally ineffective responses 
uh, angry words, expensive missiles dispatched to remote and uninhabited places, but otherwise nothing. One attack even in the United States. As they saw it, this was a crescendo leading up to the final phase, the first phase to expel the unbelievers from the lands of the believers, the final phase to bring the true faith to the lands of the unbelievers and establish the universal triumph of Islam. I think there can be little or no doubt that what happened on 9-11 was seen as the culmination of the previous process and the inauguration of the new process. And the response to it came as a shock. They had expected more of the same. Uh, they knew that um, there had been an election, but in their experience, elections don't change policies, don't change governments, governments change elections. What happened since has come as a surprise and brought a need for some reassessment. And uh, we could see that again in their websites, in their broadcasts and so on. They have great difficulty in understanding what is happening in the Western world because the free debate of an open society in which opposition and criticism are perfectly possible without necessarily meaning disloyalty or insurrection. That is alien and incomprehensible. And therefore their readings have been mostly misreadings. Um, this goes, still goes on and uh, it is fascinating to see how they interpret this, how they see it. Now, <clears throat> the role of anti-Semitism in this is the final point which I want to di discuss briefly. I think we have to be careful in using the word anti-Semitism or anti-Semite to understand precisely what we're talking about. I will say something which may strike you as absurd, but if you will think for a moment, I think you'll agree that it makes sense. It is perfectly possible to hate Jews, even to persecute Jews, without being anti-Semitic. That strikes you as nonsense. It isn't. What I mean is this. Hating people who are different, persecuting people who are different, even on occasion massacring people who are different, is part of the normal human condition. We find it all through history. We find it in every part of the world, in every civilization. Anti-Semitism is distinct in that it attributes to the victim, to the Jews, a kind of quality of cosmic evil, the like of which cannot, as far as I am aware, be found anywhere else. In the history of Islamic civilization, Jews were variously treated. Sometimes they were fairly well treated, sometimes less well. On the whole, not too badly. But anti-Semitism in that sense was simply unknown, it did not exist. It was even explicitly refuted when attempts were made by Christian minorities in the Middle East to introduce it. We have, for example, Fermans by Ottoman sultans denouncing and condemning the blood libel, saying, Jews are accused of this, this is nonsense. The anti-Semitism in the European form was introduced from Europe, it came through diplomatic and ecclesiastical channels. And unfortunately, in modern times, it has been thoroughly adopted, assimilated, and Islamized. The really major advance of anti-Semitism came in an episode which you saw parts of in the film we've just seen, the intensely close relationship between the Nazis and the Palestinian leadership at one time, which extended well beyond the Palestinian leadership. Um, the Germans were able to establish themselves in Syria thanks to the Vichy surrender to expand from Syria into Iraq uh, to create what later became the Ba'ath Party, the model for which is the Nazi Party, and to lay the foundations of a real Nazi-type anti-Semitism in the Arab Islamic world, which has since passed to other parts of the Islamic world. It has, as I said, been adopted, assimilated, and Islamized. And we can see that in many different ways. And it is one of the major problems which we have to confront today. 
My time is up, so let me conclude with that. Uh, one, one always likes to enter, end on a more happy note. Um, you have uh, mention was made of my book, Semites and Anti-Semites, which deals rather severely with the growth and development of Arab anti-Semitism. This book has just been published in Cairo in an Arabic translation. Thank you. <laughs>